Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today, I'm continuing doing these character studies, and uh, I completed the study on Abraham. Uh, so it might be helpful for you to go back and watch that study, because uh, now I'm going to begin the study on Abraham's son, Isaac. So um, all the previous studies are already uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, so feel free to go back and watch those. But today I'll begin with uh, part one of the study of Isaac. And I'm going to look at um, the um, verses that have the name Isaac in it. And let's see what we can learn about this uh, person called Isaac. Uh, first, to recap uh, some basic ideas that are, will be helpful. Um, Abraham and his wife, Sarah, were promised a son. God promised them on three different occasions over the span of many years that um, Abraham would have a son with Sarah. And that son, through his that family line, that genealogy, would come this uh, the, the the promise uh, of for him and his family and the whole world would be blessed by one a descendant of Abraham and Sarah, and we know that that uh, promised person was is Jesus Christ. Uh, but as the years passed on, Abraham and Sarah, uh, even though Abraham is renowned for being a great man of faith. Um, so many years passed that they kind of lost their faith and Abraham let Sarah convince him to have a son with the handmaiden Hagar, uh, who was an Egyptian handmaiden. Um, and from Hagar, um, Abraham had a, his first son uh, named Ishmael. But Ishmael was not the intended heir uh, that God planned. He, God said that Abraham would have a son through Sarah. Um, so uh, as time went on, um, God continued to reinforce this promise. I believe on three different occasions, God spoke to Abraham and Sarah, uh, renewing that promise. And finally, at a very old age, I think, uh, Sarah was uh, 83 or maybe 90 years old, and, and she gave birth to the son that was promised, named I, and they named him Isaac. Uh, so that's where we're going to pick up now, looking at Isaac and see what we can learn about this man. I'm looking at uh, Bible Gateway, all the references of the name Bible, I mean, uh, the, the name Isaac. Uh, let's look at first Genesis 21 12 and it says and God said unto Abraham let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bond woman the lad that's being referred to here is this first son Ishmael who was not the intended son that God had planned uh, this was because of the initiative of Abraham and Sarah trying to take it into their own hands. It's kind of like man trying to get his way to heaven on his own through his own efforts instead of just trusting that God will do it for him. So Abraham and Sarah took the initiative. They tried to make this happen on their own and they had this son, uh, Ishmael, and this bondwoman. It says, and because of thy bondwoman, and all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for Isaac shall be thy seed, thy seed be called. So the handmaiden Hagar and the son Ishmael were cast out, and they went, and God ended up promising to bless them too. And through through Ishmael came many nations in the Middle East, um, many of these Muslim nations, they, their ancestors can be traced back to Ishmael. But God says here, he reinforces this, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Then uh, Genesis 22, 2, 
it says, and he said, take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac, who thou lovest and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell of thee. Now, uh, I wanted to great detail uh, on this account of the, uh, the sacrifice of Isaac uh, in the study on Abraham. And rather than repeat that all over again, I would just ask you to go back and, and watch that uh, and uh, you'll get the full account of what happened when God told uh, Abraham to take his son Isaac up into this mountain and get, offer him as a sacrifice. Uh, so uh, for that, uh, just uh, go back rather than me repeating myself again. And I'm going to skip forward to the, beyond that point. Uh, now we're going to Genesis 24, 4. And it says, but thou hast, the, but thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. Let me look at that more context, get the verses. All the study in context. Uh, there's a saying that uh, a verse taken out of context can be a pretext. So you can make the Bible pretty much say anything you want it to say if you take verses out of context and kind of paste them all together. Uh, so when you go to context, you really try to understand the meaning of these verses. Genesis 24, verses 3 through 5. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. So Abraham and his family, they were living among the Canaanites, but Abraham did not want his son to marry from the Canaanites. He wanted his son to get a, uh, a wife from his own family. And uh, back then, uh, it was very common for, for close relatives to marry. Uh, and uh, as time gone, has gone on now through these centuries, uh, it become a less less common, actually illegal many in many places, and uh, the consequences of intermarrying close relationships sometimes uh, is is not good for the the genetic code and their birth defects. But in time past, and when we go back to Adam and Eve and their their children, uh, obviously uh, people had to marry their own close relatives in the beginning and have offspring. At that time, I think that the uh, the fall of man and uh, death entering the world and uh, mortality and then the inheriting this disease, this uh, birth defect, this genetic defect of uh, sin nature, it gradually over time, made generation after generation got worse and worse and uh, our lifespans uh, shorter and shorter, this toll of the, the fall of man has, has, has become greater on, on us through the generations. So it's not advisable now to work, marry a close relative, uh, but that's what Abraham wanted his son Isaac to do. He said in verse 4, But thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And, and the servant said unto him, See, uh, uh, Abraham was ordering his servant to, to find a wife for a son. He says, and the servant said unto him, peradventure, the woman will not be willing to follow me into this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? Um, let me look at this in the Amplified. I'm what uh, uh, Brother Joseph Sebastian Dresden calls the King James Firstest. In other words, I I always like to look at the King James translation first. And then it, sometimes I think it's helpful to look at other translations. And I, I like the Amplified because it amplifies, it expands, it expounds upon these verses. And that's what I'm doing. Every As I'm reading the verses now and talking about it, I'm amplifying or expounding or expositing 
uh, or commenting on these verses. So these same verses in the Amplified says, and you shall swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, that you will not take a wife from my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I have settled, but you shall go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, but perhaps the woman will not be willing to come uh, along after me to this country. Must I take your son to the country from which you came? So this servant is given a task to go get this wife from Abraham's family for his son Isaac. Okay, let's go back to now the next verse. Um, I'm looking at Genesis 24, 62, and it says, And Isaac came from the way of the well, Lahiroi, for he dwelt in the south country. I'm on Genesis 24, and I'm looking at now 61 through 63. And Rebekah arose and her damsels, and they rode up upon the camels and, and followed the man. And the servant took Rebekah and went his way. And as I, I and Isaac came from the way of the well, Leroy, La Hai Roy. <laughs> I'm not sure about all these pronunciations, these names. For he dwelt in the south of the country, and Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, behold, the camels were coming. So this is this is when Isaac is going to first uh, lay eyes on Rebecca. Um, and and Rebecca lifted up her eyes, and when she she saw Isaac. She lighted off the camel. <laughs> Let me look at that. Eyes. She lighted off the camel. That's a, one of the things. Several things I love about the KJV is uh, one is that I trust it, and it, it, it has a, a, some very important verses that some of the modern translations have uh, removed. Um, but but also I love the. The language in it, it's, it's Shakespearean. It's 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 poetic. It's just the most beautiful language. But at the same time, it's not really my native form of English. So I think if you're like me, it could be helpful to look at it in the Amplified too. But, um, and it says, uh, and Rebecca lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. <laughs> I want to see this lighted off the camel, what it says in the Amplified. Um, she dismounted from the camel. Not near as interesting, is it? Okay, so let's go back to um, and the servant told, this is verse 66, and the servant told Isaac all things that he had done uh, and Isaac brought her into his mother's Sarah's tent and took Rebekah and she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Now, maybe, maybe I will stand corrected. Uh, I, if you can show me from the scriptures that I'm wrong, please let me know. But. I don't see when we go back to the very first marriage, Adam and Eve, it, it just said that and, and uh, they were husband and wife. It doesn't say that there was a ceremony. It doesn't say that there was a um, uh, 
certificate of marriage. It doesn't say that there was a license for marriage. It doesn't say that there was a government agency that authorized the marriage or sanctioned it. At some point in history, uh, at least in America, I think many places around the world, governments have decided to, to be married. You had to get permission from the government. And now we have this big question, this great Supreme Court ruling that we had a couple of days ago that uh, uh, we cannot deny homosexuals the right to marry each other. And so now all the states are going to be required to approve of these uh, homosexual marriages. And my viewpoint on this, I, this, you may think this is off subject, but I think that this is a good time to express it. Um, I, I don't see any reason why a city, state, or the federal government should be involved in marriage at all. Uh, it, I don't think it is biblical that we need permission or certification from some government authority to approve of a marriage. Uh, right here, I don't see any reference to Isaac and, and uh, uh, Rebecca having a ceremony, getting a uh, uh, per permission from some government agency and getting some kind of assigned paperwork and certificate. Uh, I don't know when this became a, uh, a common practice, but I don't think God requires it. I think a marriage is, is when a man and a woman uh, make a, take a vow to each other that they're going to be a married couple and uh, be together for the rest of their life as a married couple. And that's all that's required. God knows. God's watching. God knows their intentions. And uh, if they express those intentions to each other, uh, then I think that's a marriage. But regarding the government now sticking their nose in further and saying not only does the government have the right to sanction marriage, but now in the United States, the government has the right to redefine what a marriage is and say that two people of the same sex can be a married couple and be certified by the state. Uh, if the state was not involved in this at all, um, then if two homosexuals wanted to declare that they're married, and their intentions to be a couple for the rest of their life, then they could certainly do that. But to, to make it a legitimate marriage, the state should not be playing any part of it. Uh, and, and if the state wasn't, wasn't uh, involved at all, then any two people could declare their married couple, heterosexuals or homosexuals. But I, as a Bible-believing Christian, would have the right to say, that's not my definition of marriage. My definition of marriage uh, is based on what the Bible says. It's a man and a woman. And uh, uh, homosexuality is, is uh, not approved of in the scriptures. It's condemned. It's a, it's a sin. And, and then on top of it, uh, to say that two homosexuals can actually have a marriage and it's a legitimate marriage because the state says so, they should stay out of it. The state should stay out of it. Um, but when the state gets involved and declares this is a legal marriage, then those of us who don't believe it's a legal marriage are in a position now where the government could uh, um, penalize us in some way. For example, there's a controversy about a baker being asked to make a wedding cake for a homosexual couple's wedding. And if the 
the, does the baker have to do it because uh, you know, otherwise it's discrimination or does the baker have the right to say, well, my religion does not agree that this is a marriage and I, I don't want to participate in, in uh, giving my endorsement to this, supporting it by making a cake or doing a floral arrangement or, or taking the wedding pictures or all these things. Um, uh, or even in my case, I would not perform a ceremony. You know, I, I would be willing to perform a, a wedding ceremony uh, for uh, a man and a woman uh, if they were Christians, uh, and both of them Christians. Uh, but I would not be willing to perform a, a wedding ceremony for uh, non-Christians, and, and all, certainly I wouldn't be willing to, to uh, perform a wedding ceremony for uh, two people of the same sex. And now, if the government was not sanctioning these things, then I would be free to, to say, no, I don't want to participate in that. But now that the government is saying this is illegal marriage, people who do on, a, on religious grounds do not want to participate by performing ceremonies or by uh, uh, baking a cake or any of these things. Uh, our, our right to follow our religious beliefs may be challenged here now. And we, we may be in a position where we would be penalized in some way. And if not, if not penalized legally, certainly labeled by the, 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 the majority of the society, which is secular, and, and, and the majority of the society that seems to be approving of this, we would be, be labeled as bigots, homophobes, and uh, and so on. So uh, my solution is uh, the government should not be involved in any marriages at all. And uh, uh, my wife and I got married with a legal marriage license, and uh, you know, but that was a long time ago. And uh, after a lot more thought and study about all this. Uh, I know that that was necessary for us to get certain benefits from the government as a married couple, like Social Security. But uh, I think it would be far better if the government would just get out of it entirely and say, hey, it's not our business trying to define or license marriages. All right, so if you think I'm wrong in this, I'd like to hear your opinion. But the reason this is relevant is because right now I see that it says just simply here, Genesis twenty four sixty seven. And Isaac brought her into his mother's mother Sarah's tent, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. You know, they did have some kind of a ceremony in the tent or something, but I I don't. Uh, and they probably had a big party to celebrate too, uh, but. I don't see any like governor of that area uh, signing papers or going down to the city hall somewhere and, and, and getting some paperwork done so that your, your, your marriage is sanctioned as legal. Let's look at Genesis uh, 25, 5. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. Now I better look at that in context. And the sons of Midian, Ephath and Epher and Hanak and Abadah and Eldah, and all these were the children of Keturah. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. But the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac, his son, while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. So, you know, we know that Abraham had concubines. He certainly had his, his, his wife, Sarah. And through Sarah, God promised a, uh, a genealogy that would give us our Messiah, Savior, Jesus. Uh, but uh, they, he took Hagar as his, hand, as his uh, handmaiden, or as the, she was the handmaiden. She took him 
I mean, Abraham took her, and not as a wife. I don't believe there's nothing in there that says that he they became his wife in terms of he was that was the um, the relationship, but used her basically as a kind of a surrogate to have a, a son. Um, but it looks like Abraham had other concubines too. And back at that in that time, it seems that uh, it was very common. Sometimes they had many wives. Sometimes they had, uh, uh, in addition to their wives, many concubines. When we get to uh, King Solomon, you'll find out that he took that to uh, <laughs> the, the ultimate extreme. Um, Genesis 25, 9, And his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave at Machpelah. So this is interesting because Ishmael was cast out earlier. He was sent off. He and his mother Hagar were sent off into the desert to possibly die. But God protected them and, and, and blessed them. And uh, Ishmael became very, very successful uh, and uh, with many, a great family of his own and, and uh, a father of many nations, the scripture says, but we don't hear about Ishmael all this time until the death of Abraham. And now I hear see Ishmael again. It's very interesting because perhaps even though he went away and they were cast out, Ishmael and Hagar, sounds to me like they forgave Abraham and, uh, and Sarah for casting them out. Maybe it's because God told them that, don't worry about this, you're gonna be very blessed, even though they cast you out, you're not gonna be hurting at all. And uh, so he went off and over many years later, uh, he, he grew up and became very su successful, rich, and uh, uh, the father of many nations. And, and then in his old age, Abraham dies. And here we have the burial Abraham leaves his everything he has to Isaac because he's the heir. Even though Ishmael was the firstborn, there's another controversy because the firstborn is uh, is uh, supposed to have the majority of the inheritance, and and uh, uh, we will find that more with Isaac, uh, with his two sons, uh, and Jacob and Esau, when we get to that. The, um, that inheritance, but in this case, uh, the inheritance was given to Isaac, who is not the firstborn, but was the first intended to be born by God. God did not design for Ishmael to be born. It was not God's plan. That was that was the plan of uh, Abraham and Sarah, because they they lost patience. They lost faith in God keeping his promise to, for Sarah to have, uh, have a son. So they took it into their own hands, tried to resolve the problems themselves. They came up with Ishmael. And so even though he was the firstborn, he didn't really have firstborn status because he was illegitimate in the eyes of God in terms of what God had intended. The firstborn from uh, Sarah was Isaac. So Isaac got the inheritance, and uh, it says, And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave at Machpelah in the field of Ephron, uh, the son of Zohar the Hittite, which is before Mamre. Now let's go up to Genesis 25. Well, let me look a little bit more and see if it says anything else about uh, uh, Ishmael. Okay, and the field and the field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth were there was Abraham buried and Sarah his wife. And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt by the well of Leroy. Uh, now these are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, 
Sarai's handmaiden, Baron to Abraham. Yeah, let's look at more of that. That's uh, verse 12. Uh, and these are the names of the sons of Ishmael. By their names, according to their generations, the firstborn of Ishmael was Ne Nebajoth and Kedar and Abdil and Mibsam and Mishma and Duma and Masa, Hadar and Tima and Jetur and Nafish and Kidima. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their towns and by their castles, twelve princes according to their nations. And these are the years uh, of the life of Ishmael, 130 and seven years. And he gave up the ghost and died and was gathered up, gathered unto his people. Hmm. Very interesting. So it never really dawned on me before about uh, after Hagar and Ishmael were cast out that Ishmael would come back and, and be, had been very successful, come back, the buried uh, Abraham and uh, Sarah, and, and, then, and that he had all these sons and, and princes of all these towns. Um, of course, we do know that that was God's promise to Hagar and to Ishmael. All right, let me go back to verses about Isaac now. And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Uh, Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. 20. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, what his wife conceived. A lot of barren women. Uh, Sarah was barren. Now we see that uh, Rebecca was barren until Isaac had prayed and God answered the prayer, and then Rebecca was able to conceive. And it says, uh, and Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him. So the Lord answered his prayer, and Rebekah's wife conceived, and the children struggled together within her. She had twins growing inside her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Yeah, there's going to be uh, between uh, Jacob, that's going to be Jacob and Esau. And when we get to those characters later, that's, that's a fascinating story about what happens with them but uh so uh, rebecca isaac isaac's wife is pregnant expecting these and the lord says explains that it's two sons two twins and they're going to be two nations Uh, 
Isaac was three score years old when she bare them. So Isaac was 60 years old when Rebecca had these children and Jacob and Esau. Uh, let's look at Genesis 25, 28 now. It says, and Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Have you ever uh, asked the question or been asked the question, you know, which, which of your children do you love the most? I have one child, my son, Mark. <laughs> so I, I've never had to even think about answering this kind of a question. But I know that my mother, who had five children, she always said she loved us all the same. Uh, and that's, that's kind of like the politically correct kind of thing to say. And maybe it is true that uh, a parent will love the children the same, but love them differently. To this, they love, maybe they love them to the same degree, but the kind of love is a little bit different because the relationship with each child is a little different. So, but then I think sometimes a parent actually will love one child and much more than the other maybe love one child and not even love the other. But it's interesting here in this case, we've got Isaac loves Esau, and it says because he makes him venison. So Esau is a really good hunter, gets, kills venison and makes this venison for his father, and that's, that's what it says. That's why Isaac loves him. It doesn't say he doesn't love uh, love uh, uh, Jacob, but it, but it doesn't say that uh, he does. So uh, assuming that he does love both his sons, he has a special preference for Esau. And it seems to be really very shallow, based on something very shallow, that he really likes the venison that he prepares for him. Uh, and then uh, Rebecca, though, it says that she loves Jacob. And it doesn't say that she doesn't love Esau too, but she has a particular or special or greater love for Jacob. Um, you know, let's look at... Uh, Twenty-five, twenty-eight. Let me look at this in context here. And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. Uh, I don't want to go into this too much now because when we do the study of Jacob and Esau, then I'll go into more about what happened. But Jacob, the name Jacob literally translates to trickster or schemer or liar. So uh, we're going to find that Jacob, that's the kind of character that he had and he, uh, he later would be renamed by God and called Israel. So the father of Israel, the man named Israel, is, uh, was really a dishonest a liar and a trickster. Um, so um, what he does to his brother and, and the inheritance, so we'll get to that later, but for now, Let's talk more about Isaac. Isaac. Um, 
Test 20 says one, and there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, and dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will give, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. So uh, God is continuing to restate and reinforce this promise he made. He promised it numerous times to Abraham, and now he's saying, this promise I give you, Father, I'm giving to you. And uh, it's promise was basically twofold that he would be a great nation over over this land uh father and uh, he would also be uh from from him would come all, all the whole world would be blessed through the through this seed of abraham and the seed is singular and that means this the seed that it's referring to is a particular person that comes from that genealogy from abraham Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, David, we get Jesus. And all, all of these things are part of biblical prophecy saying this seed would come from these particular people. So Jesus is this promised seed that would bless the entire world. And would bless them. The whole world is blessed by Jesus because the scripture says that he's the Lamb of God uh, who. Uh, uh, died for the sins of the whole world and uh, he's the propitiation for our sins not only ours but uh, for the whole world so Jesus uh, this seed of Abraham Isaac and Jacob he is the one who was promised that would be a, the whole world would be blessed and not only blessed but saved through the faith of Jesus and he says uh, Uh, and Isaac dwelt in Gerar and it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech the king of the Philistines looked out a window and saw and behold Isaac was sporting with Rebekah his wife And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, of surety she is thy wife, and how sayest thou she is my sister? And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, Lest I die for her. Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold. See, Abraham lied about Sarah being his wife because he was afraid that the king would kill him to take his wife. Uh, now we see Isaac's done the same thing. He's lied about Rebecca being his wife for fear that the king would take his life and take his wife. So they both lie. Is that really a godly thing to do for these great men of faith or is or are some lies justified do you think it would be okay to lie to save someone you think it'd be okay to lie to save yourself uh, obviously we're not supposed to lie um, but what if you had fugitives in your home? Let's say it's in the World War II and the, the Nazis were looking for some Jews and you were given the Jew sanctuary and you had them hidden somewhere in your home and the Nazis came inquiring and they asked you directly, do you know where they are? Or would, 
would you feel obligated to say yes because you were obligated to tell the truth? But by telling the truth, they will die. They will be killed. Or is it better to lie and the, these people will be not found out and they will be spared and live? So even though Abraham lied and Isaac lied about their wives, I, I think that uh, in a way it's a taint on them, but in a way it, you can understand it may have been justified for fear that, that the king would kill them so that the king could take their wife. Um, And Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. So Isaac was so blessed by God. Let me look at this in more context. Uh, 26 12. Uh, and Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He that toucheth this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. So Abimelech issues a decree that uh, Isaac is to be protected. No one should hurt him or his wife. And it says, Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man waxed great and went forward and grew up until he became very great. For he had possessions of flocks and possession of herds and great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. So, you know, God promised that he was going to bless Abraham and Isaac and his descendants and, and uh, make sure that they grew and prospered and became this great nation. That Abraham would be a father of many nations. And the father of many nations, I, I think that, uh, that that's reference to the fact that uh, the gospel is in many nations all over the world and he is the father of our faith and that he 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 was saved by putting his faith in god to keep his promise of this uh seed and uh so uh, we, we all are um, um, in that way uh, you know part of this blessing um, and so God blessed Abraham and then Isaac, and he became very wealthy. And it says, um, And the Lord appeared unto him that night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And, and there Isaac's servants digged a well. And Okay, let me go back to the. Uh, 
Let's look at Genesis 26, 27. It says, And Isaac said unto them, Wherefore come ye to me, seeing ye hate me, and have sent me away from you? Um, and they said, We saw certainly that the Lord was with thee, and we said, let there be now an oath betwixt us, even betwixt us and thee, and let us make a covenant with thee. So when the king and the people of that area, it was plain to them that uh, Isaac was very blessed by God. And uh, I don't even know if they even understood who this God was. But they, they knew that uh, his, his wealth and blessing and how quickly he became wealthy was abnormal, or it was supernatural. And uh, so they, they wanted to make a, a pact, kind of a covenant with him. In other words, they didn't want to be on his bad side. They wanted to be allies with him. Uh, let's look at verse chapter 27. And it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his eldest son, and said unto him, My son. And he said unto him, Behold, here am I. So now we're getting to this part about the trick, trickster, the schemer. And he said, Behold, now I am old, I know not the day of my death. Now therefore I pray thee thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go out to the field and take me some venison, and make me savory meat such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. So, uh, Esau was the, the firstborn. If we go back to the birth. I skipped over that, but at the birth, they were twins. And uh, there was a struggle to get out first. And uh, let me go back and see if I can find that again here. Oops. Hmm. Okay. It's a very interesting birth here. Um, I don't want to say something wrong about it, so I want to go right to it. Okay. And, we're, and when her days to be delivered were fulfilled to give birth, it was time for uh, Rebecca to give birth. Behold, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red, all over like a hairy garment. And they called his name Esau. So Esau was the firstborn. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. And he was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. So Esau was the firstborn. Now they're twins. Just because one comes out first, 
it seems like a very minor thing, a matter of sec minutes or seconds, and the second one comes out. Uh, but the firstborn has this special status, and he's, he's to be the one that gets the blessing and the, the majority of the inheritance. So when it comes time for uh, Isaac to, he's near death, he favored his son Esau because he was a hunter and he made great venison. And he, he knows he's going to die soon. He asks his son to prepare him this meal. So he goes off and then uh, Rebecca and Jacob conspire together to prepare the meal and present it to him and get a blessing and trick Isaac into thinking that that uh, Jacob is actually Esau. They go to great length even to put a, a hairy covering on his arm so when uh, Isaac touches his arm, he feels it's hairy and because he knew that uh, Esau was a hairy man compared to, to uh, Jacob. So Rebecca and Jacob conspire and trick him. And uh, they, they trick him into uh, giving a blessing to Jacob instead of uh, the son that he wanted to bless, Esau. So that's how, that's how Isaac, I and mean, that's how Jacob got the blessing in place of, of Esau. Now, again, just as we had uh, Isaac and Ishmael, they were half-brothers. They went off and became great nations and different factions. And from, from uh, Isaac, we get the, the Israelites. And from Ishmael, we get the uh, Middle Eastern people that are, uh, let's say, they're primarily uh, Arabian and uh, um, now mostly Muslim people, but uh, that they were both in the same father. And then we have Jacob and Esau, twins, both have the father, uh, Isaac and the mother, Rebecca, and they're struggling even at birth. And then Esau is entitled and preferred by the father and yet Rebecca and Jacob conspire to trick uh, Isaac into giving the blessing to uh, to uh, J uh, Jacob instead, and they, they succeeded. They got the blessing, but Esau he went off and he became a great nation too. But but he went and uh, to another country and uh, became great and successful and, and uh, had uh, great wealth. But he intermarried with those people. And again, so we have Ishmael and Esau kind of going in one direction, becoming certain people. And then we have uh, Isaac and, and Jacob going the other direction. And through them, in this family line that God intended for the seed to come from. They, they become this nation of Israel. Okay, we're getting, uh, I can, I think I'll rehash the uh, Jacob and Esau story a little bit more in a separate study, but uh, for now, Let's look at uh, let's look at uh, Isaac as he's old and dying. And Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Padaran and to Laban, son of Bethuel. Syrian, the brother of Rebecca, Jacob's, and Esau's mother. Well, 
Now, when we get to Genesis 35, 28, there most of the story really at this point moves on to following um, Jacob and Esau. But at Genesis 35, 28, it says, and the days of Isaac were 104 score. Four score is 80 years. So he lived to be 180 years old. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people and being old and full of days and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. All right. One of the things that I think was, becomes real obvious through these character studies is that even the greatest characters are all flawed. And uh, it doesn't matter if it's uh, uh, after the cross or before the cross. Uh, the scripture says that we all fall short of the glory of God. Uh, uh, the, the greatest people in the Bible. I mean, look at uh, Adam when he fell. Uh, Noah got drunk. Moses murdered. Uh, and David murdered in adultery. Uh, uh, Peter denied Jesus. Paul, you know, uh, laid waste to the church. Thomas wouldn't believe until he saw and touched Jesus. They, everybody fails. And these failures, these weaknesses, these flaws, and all of them, even the greatest heroes of the Bible, should uh, help us to understand that Yes, you and I, all of us, we, we all fall short. And that's why we need Jesus. So the last thing I want to say today for closing is that uh, the biggest mistake that the whole world has, has made throughout history and today is thinking that if they believe in God and they believe in life after death, that somehow... They can please God by living a good life, and God will reward them with life everlasting in heaven because, because it's a reward for being good. That's where all the religions of the world teach, that if you, you go to heaven, if you deserve it, if you're a good person. But that's not what the Bible says. For the, from beginning to end, the Bible says that now we're all sinners. Now we all need to be saved. We, we, it's impossible for man to get to heaven through his own effort. We all fall short of perfection. We have to be perfect to satisfy God. Are you perfect? If you're perfect, then you don't need Jesus. But if you think you're perfect, you deceive yourself, and the truth is not in you. So if we understand that, no, we're not perfect, we all fall short. Some people, I know that seem to be worse than others, but even the, the Bible says the very best of men is like filthy rags in the sight of God. Think of the very best person you've ever met in your life. Think of the very best person you've ever heard about in history. The Bible says their righteousness is like filthy rags in the sight of God. So the best man, when we compare him to Jesus, all so far short by comparison, it's like filthy rags. That's the first thing you need to understand is that it's futile, it's hopeless to try to work your way to heaven on your own. You need to throw up your hands at the feet and surrender and say, I can't do it. I need to be saved. And the Bible says there's one savior. This is Jesus Christ. Who is he? He's God. He's eternal. He's not a creature. He's always existed. He's God. And the Bible says that he came down from heaven and became a man. Jesus said the reason he became a man was so he could give his life as a ransom for many. He died on a cross, cross as a ransom. A ransom is a payment made to set someone free. Jesus died and, and to set us free from judgment. We don't have to be judged and found guilty if we put our faith in Jesus. So on that cross, he paid for all of our sins so that you and I could go to heaven through him. 
Yeah, that's all that's required of you. Believe in Jesus. Trust Jesus. Stop trying to uh, get there on your own and stop believing that it's impossible. It's possible for you to work your way to heaven. First, the first thing, and, and and then trust Jesus instead of trusting yourself. Why should you trust Jesus? Why should you believe in this Jesus? Well, he's worthy of our faith. He said that uh, they asked the Jews asked for a sign from him to prove who he is and all his claims. And he said he'd give a sign, the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, he would be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. He was talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. He said that he would raise himself from the dead after his crucifixion. Did he do it? There's a lot of eyewitnesses at that time that were willing to die for that, that claim. They said they saw him. They touched him. He's alive again in body, in, in the flesh. He raised himself from the dead, and there's witnesses. So that's the sign that gives us confidence that our faith in Jesus is justified. And when you put your faith in him, he puts the Holy Spirit in you. The Holy Spirit of God lives in you, starts transforming you, and the Holy Spirit indwells you and seals you and will never leave you or forsake you. So you can never lose your salvation. Once you put it, your faith in Jesus, as Scripture says that Jesus said, I hold you in the palm of my hand. It's like this. He grabs you in his hand. You embrace him through faith. Now, if you sin, it doesn't matter. He's got, he's still got you. Doesn't mean it's not, you should try to sin. It just means that you know, no one's going to be able to live after we get saved their whole life without sinning. So if we sin, we don't have to worry that we've lost our salvation. No one can pluck you out of his hand. If you lose faith, he remains faithful. The Bible says when we have no faith, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. He promises he'll never leave you or forsake you. So he cannot deny himself and break that promise. Isn't that wonderful? That's why it's called the gospel. Gospel just means good news. I hope you've found this to be good news. It's, it's the best news. That God loves us so much that way he would do this for us so that we can have eternal life in heaven. So put your faith in Jesus now. If you do that, make a comment. Let me know. I'd love to hear that someone believed today. I'll pick up my study next Sunday and take a closer look at uh, Jacob and Esau. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.